All right, let me throw out the first question. Um, Paul, does the, does the work that you do with partners globally impact the brand at Stanford? I mean, it really must increase the perception and impact of the university across the, around the world. It's got to be huge. You, you, you think that way, but the places that I go to, they don't know what Stanford University is. Interesting. Yeah, and which is fine. I'm there to help them uh, empower themselves. And it's not about branding, it's, it's not about anything else, but to help them change their lives. So, you know, I don't think they will understand what Stanford University is all about, but they will understand why I'm there and then how the solutions that I'm introducing to the communities would help them. And does the work you're doing encourage students who are interested in this to come to Stanford? My, Absolutely. I get emails from students from different parts of the world and say, I want to come to Stanford. And I have to say, I look forward to meeting you. But the admission is a little, you know, I <laughs> <laughs> hope you make it. But another way to do it is that sometimes I take even high school students to these places, let them see the real world. And then they change their mindset. They say, wow, I did not know that over one billion people live on a one dollar a day. They did not know that. When they realize the real world, their passion starts to kick in and they say, I wanna do this for life. Yeah. And then they prepare, they prepare SAT scores, they start to write essays and all these things and they do come to Stanford and I, I have a few of those students who are in my class. Very good, very good. <laughs> Anything from you guys? Come on. These guys were so overwhelming, you're kind of just sitting there, huh? <laughs> okay. We have some questions over there. Remote campuses are incredibly innovative, but I'm curious as to the implication on personal relationships. Does technology put us into different silos or does it uh, actually help us connect? Who wants to jump into that? Go ahead, Jeff. Actually, I was, I was looking at Cisco. All right, yeah. <laughs> All right Lily, go for it. <laughs> Actually, um, I don't believe that you are impacted at all on a personal level uh, with virtual campuses. Uh, I had a, an employee based in Richardson, Texas, and we have telepresence that's pretty prolifer proliferated at Cisco. We did all of our weekly one-on-ones via telepresence. Um, because of the high definition quality, I can see if he's sweating, uh, if I ask a tough question, and uh, I can see when we're connecting. And so because the technology has evolved so, we're able to make those real-time connections. Um, even one of the technical team members here today, we've been on video calls for the last eight weeks or so preparing, and it's like we've met several times uh, over. And so I don't think that you can, um, I don't think that technology is going to hinder your ability to build relationships. I think it's all up to you. Um, Jeff, with iTunes U, who are some of the most successful universities out there and why are they, wh who uses it most effectively and why does it work? Well, I, I'd probably get in trouble if I didn't okay. mention Stanford. <laughs> uh, so, so Stanford, UC Berkeley, uh, Duke, uh, they've all got very large iTunes U instances. Uh, we, we've seen, um, even down in the community college space, Southwestern Community College has a great mm -hmm. iTunes U space. So it, it, it's not limited by four-year universities or two-year two universities. And in addition to the university space and the college space, we've also added an iTunes U beyond. Uh, the Khan Academy, if you haven't had a chance to check out the Khan Academy on iTunes U, it's a fantastic, uh, fantastic implementation. Very good. Next question in the audience. I think you have a couple. There's some questions. Oh, well, okay. Let me do one more from Twitter and then we'll go to you. If students are creating the content and faculty don't want to learn technology, isn't the gap going to grow rather than shrink? You know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, in the campuses where we've empowered students with technology, uh, I think it lights a fire under the faculty in a way that uh, isn't there if the, the students aren't, aren't pushing. And so uh, we've actually seen when, when you empower the students with the technology, the, the faculty quickly want to get on board. And there, there are instances where the students then become the resource, the technology teachers in the classroom, and, and the faculty look to the, the, the students to close that gap. Very so, good. You had a live question.
So how can high school students get involved with what yes. Paul's doing? Yes, and the second one is how do we accelerate this kind of technology innovations, very simple innovations, not the iPad, not the iPhone, but just technology innovations that we can easily create in our first world from our resources and uh, knowledge to create social global impact. How can we accelerate what you're doing and what other organizations are doing? How can we accelerate? Because what you're doing is so lame. I mean, you're not doing a good job at all. How do we accelerate this thing? Come on. <laughs> well, it's not about how. It's about when can we start. You know, I'm ready to do it. I already have high school interns who are participating in some of these projects. So it's just a matter of getting connection and then just starting it. I do not want to talk about things. I want to just do it. Okay. Very good. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Stick with the Twitter questions. All right, no more live people. Okay, for the panel, is the closing of borders just a foreshadowing of bookstores and libraries closing due to the rise of technology? We'll deal with books extensively this afternoon, but let's take a shot at the question. Who wants this? I guess I'll jump in here. Uh, you know, I, I think that the, the plates in the, the tectonic plates beneath the publishing industry are, are shifting. Uh, and I think there are companies that are taking advantage of those shifts and companies that are not. So I, I think that uh, we're seeing a lot of this go digital and it's happening faster than, um, th than we had anticipated. Mm -hmm. ahead, I think Lil. there'll always be a place for paper-based books. Um, we move in and out of learning styles and people learn differently all over. Um, I agree, I think there's definitely a technology shift taking place in that industry, but I think there's going to be a place for both. Show of hands, how many people prefer traditional books? Want to hold a real paper book in your hand? How many people prefer iBooks? <laughs> Shift is happening. I'm a little bummed, the story of my life. The, the, the month my biggest book comes out, the, one of the biggest chains goes out of business, so it's perfect timing for me. Is your, is your book digital too? Uh, yeah, it'll be, yeah, all formats is downloadable, and, we, and I just got my first audio book thing yesterday, so I'll be curious to see how the whole mix works out with sales and stuff. But uh, we'll find out, we'll find out. Other questions? Twitter, how can Biola partner with NGOs in, or, in other nations in an attempt to evenly disseminate all of this technology? That's a great question for Paul. Go well, ahead. again, it's a matter of when can we start? Well, I mean, what's stopping us? What are the barriers? I don't see any barriers. I think it, what, it, what, the, what the barrier might be is our mindset to change or to take an action. So if we have that mindset, we are ready to do it. I think that we should do it. If we don't do it, yeah. I think that's a mistake. What's the biggest obstacle to the work you're doing? Mindsets, changing people's mindsets. I mean, even if I go to some of the communities where the community leaders come to me and say, do not come here because I do not want my kids to be educated. And that is the huge you, challenge. You hear that? Yes, I do hear that. Because they say, if my kids get education, they're gonna leave. And you know, I, don't wanna, I do not want to see that. And so uh, that's one kind of a, a difficult mindset to work with. Uh, different kind of mindsets that I get time to time is, you know, it doesn't smell like, it doesn't look like, or it acts like a classroom, so it's not a classroom. I don't like this technology classrooms. You know? yeah. uh, that's a social DNA issue. So I think that it's gonna evolve over time. And when we have more species with a new mindset, mm -hmm. I think we're gonna be all okay. <laughs> That's true. It's true, in my book I talk about the fact that technology changes exponentially, but people change incrementally. Uh, we, we're always lagging behind. It's the mindset, I think, more than anything else that really needs significant change yeah. happening out there, huh? Next question on Twitter. Will virtual classrooms start affecting tuition costs? When can we start? This has to be from an administrator. Yeah. Um, when can we start seeing this? That would be a good Lily question. I, I don't know that they will impact tuition costs. I think it's a matter of how do you make content more readily available on demand, um, and how do you scale the availability of that content globally? Um, Everything costs, right? So you're gonna make an investment, but it's more the ROI and how you're gonna get the return on that investment uh, in the long term. Well, I think that the budget cuts that are happening in many institutes around the world, it's an external pressure. 
And it's creating a positive uh, spin in the education ecosystem. For example, in UK, uh, they're sending more students to the online classes. And the Cal State systems here in California as well, they want more online courses for the uh, fr first freshman uh, programs. The weird thing is that they take online courses while they're in their dorm. And I don't get that. Why do they need to be in the dorm <laughs> while taking the co courses online? Go to college yeah. to take online courses. Exactly. Perfect, perfect I don't plan. understand that part. But I think that it's going to take some time for people to understand how to best model these technologies so that it's not just the online versus offline, but it should be online blended learning blended. to maximize student learning. That's really good, really good. Other questions? Do you think Twitter? Is there any other innovative examples or ideas of show and share use outside education? Where else could we do this? Good question. Yeah, actually, um, Show and share is pretty popular uh, in, in the enterprise, in um, business, uh, because there are, again, lots of video assets that are available, and companies are looking to get messaging out. Um, we do product launches with show and share. Uh, we also, at Cisco, do quite a bit of um, internal, just internal communications. Uh, lots of groups are actually adopting it as a way to collaborate and to innovate around different projects. We launched an external innovation contest, and part of that contest was each of the contestants had to submit a video of their idea, and we leveraged show and share for them to do that and to do so securely that they could collaborate as a team. Very cool, very cool. All right, last couple questions. There's Twitter only, questions. only doing Twitter. Come on, you got to Twitter it. <laughs> We're techie here. Um, for Lily, what's the availability for in consumer for show and share technology? Well, today, show and share is more geared for um, sort of a, an enterprise version of a YouTube. Um, we haven't had plans right now for, to consumerize it because most consumers are using the YouTube platform. So um, I would say that's not in the, on the roadmap today, but certainly something we can consider if there's a market for it. Very cool. All right, last question on Twitter. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> Do we not have one? We have to go to the live. All right, hit me. What is it? Um, how do you, uh, I'm a faculty member at Cal State Florida. Okay. Perfect. Well, and, and okay, let me repeat the question for those in the back. <laughs> immediate correction. In, in a classroom, a professor can immediately correct a student. But online, you can't necessarily do that at that moment. How does that impact what you're doing, Jeff? Well, and, and I think, you know, in, in the, uh, the model that I described, the issue is that um, you're worried about the video going live, right? And going out to, to the students. Is that correct? Okay. So. What's really nice about a college campus is it has something YouTube doesn't. Uh, it's got faculty that can filter content. And the way that we look at this student-generated model is that students, the videos wouldn't go live to even their peers or the world until it was looked at by a faculty member. So I, I'm not saying that if you assign out a video project, you're going to get 100% of your students creating high-quality work. You're probably going to get the same distribution you'd get if you assign them a paper or math problems. <laughs> uh, you're going to have your A videos, B videos, C videos, D videos. And what we're saying is that, look, the, the process the students go through is highly intellectual. Uh, it forces them to learn content and go through an experiential learning process. But at the end of the day, the A videos can then become posted for other students to learn from. So I, I'm not advocating that you turn your iTunes U instance into a YouTube for education. In fact, the opposite. I think those videos need to be vetted by a professor before they go live. If I may go ahead, add please. to it, I, I don't like the word teaching. Uh, I like the word of facilitating and coaching. I think that teaching is 20th century word now. 21st century word is more of empowering and inspiring students. Uh, how do we correct problems? I always empower students to correct themselves and then give them credits. And when they realize what they could do and when they are empowered, all these great things happen. I think that it's oftentimes teachers and professors get in their way. So if uh, you cannot just take what's happening in the classroom, just put it on the online. That's not going to work. You have to change the whole 
whole uh, ecosystem there. So my suggestion is how do you leverage the power of the crowd, the power of your students in, in your own uh, environment? And that's what I would do. So do you, no do more teaching, facilitate coach them and get out of the way. I, I, I like that idea, and I like the idea that everyone on campus is a contributor in that educational experience, right? So um, one of the things that they did in Loma Linda is they had the students embed mistakes within their videos on purpose uh, so that they were putting videos out. Here, watch these four videos. They all cover anthrax, but three of them have mistakes. So identify the mistakes and, and write a paper as to how you'd fix them. Mm -hmm. Apparently, some professors are twittering death threats for Paul here, so we might want to dis dismiss this section. Uh, let's hey, give him a big hand, please. We're evolve. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay, you can you can go down. Thank you. Okay. Oh, right. Well, hold on a second. We have it. Wait a minute. Come right back. Yeah, we're piping in somebody. Jeff Young. Is that right? Is he here? Pipe him in. Ah, Jeff. Sorry yes, about that. Hi. We Can almost forgot me? about you, man. Yes. Welcome. Oh, forgot about me. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I'm not that late. We have. You have a couple questions for us. Is that right? I did. Yeah. No. I. Um. I, I apologize for not being able to hear all the um, session today, but um, it sounds like a great, uh, great lineup, and I wish I could be there in person. Um, I'm Jeff Young. I'm a reporter with the, the Chronicle of Higher Education out in Washington D.C., and I cover this tech stuff at campuses. Um, all the time and may have hopefully talked with some of you um, in the past for stories. Um, and we, um, one of the things I look at is uh, this column I write called College 2.0 and how technology is changing campuses and in a lot of different ways, in a lot of the ways that I think um, the speakers have just been talking about. But I'm really curious to hear their views. My um, questions, I just have like two or three, and they're really more to try to um, there are things that I'm hearing a lot about that are big themes that we're tracking. And I think that they really play into the kind of discussion that has been going on there based on some notes that have been sent to me about what, what has been said just now. Um, the first one actually is, you know, I'm watching all this and the exciting things that are being talked about, about how, you know, new ways of teaching with the technology and um, getting people to do more, um, you know, using the mobile, using um, these technologies that have never been around before, like the iPad. And the, um, it's all very exciting, but I guess I'm curious from, um, especially from your perspective, um, a couple of you there from Apple and um, you know, um, uh, uh, Cisco, I believe, are not in higher ed. So you can really kind of look from the outside a little bit, even though I know you know the higher ed world well. Um, and I guess I'm curious, do you think that um, what might end up happening is that with all these tools and with all this desire for new ways of learning by some students and non-traditional students and the cost of higher ed going up and up, that some new player could come in from the outside that's not at a traditional four-year college um, that might end up pushing these things quicker than the universities, the traditional universities are doing. Like, for instance, the Khan Academy, um, I don't know if people are familiar with that, it might have even been talked about, of this um, guy who, in his uh, walk-in closet at home, has made it into a video education studio, and he's the most popular education content on YouTube with millions of hits. He's adding instructional parts to his website that test students, and his one idea is to have, like, um, to potentially even offer kind of degrees from his closet. I mean, is there a way that something else could come in and disrupt here that instead of the universities that are maybe slowly evolving? I I think that, that the Khan Academy in some ways already has. Uh, <laughs> I remember reading, and, and for those of you that don't know about the Khan Academy, uh, it, 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 he was a financial analyst that was uh, building videos with Microsoft Paint for his niece uh, yeah. that was struggling with algebra. So he started building a few videos for algebra, but I believe now he has over 1,800 videos, everything from uh, basic math to economic theory. And uh, his goal is to, to build an entire curriculum of every single subject there is to, to know about, um, all in his closet using Microsoft Paint. So pretty phenomenal. And I, I, I think that the disruption is here. I think that um, you know one of the things that, that the Khan Academy needs to figure out that the university still has an edge up on is this sense of community, right? And uh, I think that once, once they get that figured out, you know, it's going to be a really interesting world in higher education. Hmm. Yeah, community learning has been around for a while. I mean, you're 
If you have older siblings, they probably tutored you. And uh, you know that's happening even today. I think what you're seeing technology do, though, is bring it to light and it's able to scale at levels that it never would have been able to do before. Um, however, Khan is not an accredited university. Oh, true, yeah. And, and, and so um, I think a little bit of disruption and competition is healthy. I think it keeps the higher ed institutions on their toes, and I think that's a good thing. Um, but I don't know that something like that would ever t fully replace it because it is not an accredited institution. And is there, it's hard for me to tell whether other people want to jump in or whether. Um... Well, if I may jump in. <laughs> Basically, making things available doesn't really change someone's lives. There are more than enough information out there. I have, uh, uh, we have actually a PhD student who is only 18 years old. Uh, he's in the neurocognitive uh, science uh, major. He got out of school early on. He got out when uh, he was at, uh, in the fourth grade and he studied uh, all by himself. Mm -hmm. And he made to Stanford PhD program. Uh, I get students like them uh, quite often uh, who come to my office and then present themselves. And then I think that some of them are really great. I mean, they're great scientists already. Uh, they have never been to college, but they already have that mindset and then they have the passion to learn. And they, they have done that through the existing available contents out there already. So it's not just a matter of making more contents out there. I think that that's the old paradigm. I think the new paradigm is how do we give them the value? How do we show them the value of learning and changing yeah. your own life? And that's something that we're not teaching. And I think that we should do something about that. Very good. And the other thing that I was very curious to hear the thoughts of the panelists on is, you know, I, I do talk to a lot of people about the high tech um, projects they're working on that are innovative and cutting edge and the kind of things that I think some people have outlined this um, today. And sometimes, though, I was just talking with someone at Abilene Christian University where they've given a, a, an iPhone or iPod Touch to every student now. And they are really, uh, you know, one of the places trying to figure out what do you, so what, you know, what do you do with all these, what can you get if you have everyone on mobile? And, you know, they've done a lot of things that are interesting. And there was one, one of the things they've come up with that's really good is the scavenger hunt um, idea that a lot of students, it gets them out of the classroom and they're, they're out there doing these things. And one professor that I interviewed though recently told me that he um, loves this idea and it's working well, but he, one day the network couldn't, they had some network problem and everyone couldn't get online and so you had to go to plan B. Plan B was the same scavenger hunt with paper clues on index cards that he bought from you know the drugstore for, for five bucks. And he said it went just as well in a lot of ways. And I guess it just, I just want to challenge you guys. I know that, um, you know, I love this technology. There's a lot of um, uh, exciting projects going on that we'll keep writing about. But I guess there's always that question by some skeptical faculty and others about the what if, is it really worth it? And how do you know when you're doing something that really is a tech solution or whether you should maybe think uh, back to the future and go old school? Is it all worth it? And do you think, uh, what do you say to a faculty member who says, what about the, you know, maybe it's not all needed to have all this gadget, gadgetry? I think, uh, you know, one of my favorite quotes is, uh, don't solve a social problem using technology, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that you, you need to use technology where, where it makes sense. And, you know, one of the reasons we're excited about the, uh, the student generated approach, right, is that it, it allows students to go through an experiential learning process, but then the, the knowledge they create is captured, right? And, and if, they, if it was annotated, think about how amazing that would be, right? Um, if you could search through it and it was annotated, I think that, that would radically change things. So I, I think that um, blindly using technology for technology's sake is absolutely the wrong way to look at this. Uh, I think that you need to identify places where, where technology can help um, instead of just uh, show off a cool gadget, right? Exactly. Simply proliferating a campus with technology isn't going to solve a problem. It all starts with a vision. And technology is an enabler of a vision that's been thoroughly thought out and, and collaborated against. And you have clear goals and objectives that you're trying to achieve. 
Mm. So the key word that I often use is the ecosystem. It's not just a piece of technology, but you have to look at the ecosystem and what is the incentive for the, all the constituencies in the ecosystem. You know, technology is important, but pedagogy is more important, and the content is also important. And then what is the value for everybody involved in this ecosystem is even more important. So you can never look at a piece of technology as a, a solution for everything. You have to look at the whole ecosystem and try to make a perfect model. It seems to me, and there are some surveys we have seen where the use, like the course management system is pretty much almost 100% of universities have some sort of LMS. Um, and yet the number of faculty who say they do anything beyond post the syllabus is so much smaller than I would think. And I guess how do you, your advice just then sounded very sound, but I wonder how do you get institutions to go there, to get there when the ecosystem Maybe the ecosystem is there, but the <laughs> hasn't gone to the to the revolution <laughs> or the much of an evolution. Right, because that means that they do not see the value of technology in that case. If they don't see the value, they are not going to change anything. They they have to see the value, and you have to show them the value uh, that technology can play a role in that such ecosystem. In my case, learning management system is just a content repository system. Even in my class, I ask students to blog every day. I ask students to create videos every day. I mean, that's the kind of things that I do. I, I just don't use a learning management system and then believe in it and then you know hope that this is the platform. I do not think so. I think there are many things that you have to do to make your technology work for your context. So, uh, you know, when you adopt the technology, don't believe that this is going to change everything. Great. Well, I appreciate you guys letting me uh, beam in and, and, and uh, bug you for a couple minutes. And okay. this has been interesting for me. And um, I wish I could join you for the rest of the, the sessions. It sounds great. Let's, thank, let's give him a big hand, Jeff Young. Thank you, guys. Jeff is the uh, technology editor for the Chronicle of Higher Education. We were very fortunate to have him drop in and talk to us, so uh, thank you very much for that. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.